We're speaking with Professor Chaim Shor from the Department of Industrial Engineering and Management at Ben-Gurion University of the Negev in Eretz Israel. I'm Avi ben Mordechai, And uh, our discussion with Professor Shor will be dealing with areas of cosmology and case design in biblical Hebrew, that there's order, there is design. Everything in the biblical Hebrew, in the Torah, the prophets, the writings, every word, phrase, idea, there seems to be more than just randomness going on. There seems to be exact order. Things are being told to us that unfortunately are getting lost in translation between Hebrew and English. Talking with Professor Chaim Shor of Ben Gurion University of the Negev, and uh, we're discussing biblical designs in the Hebrew text. We're talking about symmetry, uh, randomness, the world of nature, the world of the creation story, and uh, I hope you'll join us for this upcoming program to discuss some of the intricacies of the Hebrew language and the Bible. Professor Chaim Shor has written a book. We're going to be talking about the cases of design in biblical Hebrew. So let us consult the interview that I conducted with Professor Chaim Shor at the offices of the university that we could discuss with him some of these ideas that uh, he was sharing with me. I now share them with you. I think that the Torah has a message. I myself was surprised to find how precise the Torah is. In fact, I'm sometimes sorry that I find translation of the Torah that are not exact and the original meaning is lost. I have uh, on my blog a, a whole uh, a post about the mathematical precision of the Torah, but uh, I want to concentrate on three simple examples. You read Genesis, the first chapter. Vayi Erev, Vayi Boker, Yom Echad. What is the English translation? Most Bible translations say, and there was evening, and there was morning, first day. Now Avi, tell me, how can there be a first day if there's still no second day? You can't say first day when the other five days were not, didn't exi exist yet. So I went from one translation to the next until I found the right translation. It was Vayerev, Vayboker, Yom Echad. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. This is the right uh, translation. Let me give you another example. Love thy, ne thy neighbor as yourself. Is this what is written in the Torah? Not exactly. Tell me, a fisherman, does he love fish? And the answer is, yes, of course he loves fish. You can love fish and you can love your child. Totally different kind of love, of love even though you use the same word. You love fish because it has good taste, it satisfies your desires, your wishes. This is one kind of love, this is the egoistic love. When you say I love my child, is because I am there available to the child to fulfill his desires, his wishes, just to be there for him. 
So how is it written in the Torah? Is it written, love your neighbor as yourself? Not at all. It's very, very strange formulation. In Hebrew it says, Ve'ahavta l'reacha kamocha. It's not, I'll translate it literally, it's not love your neighbor. It's love to your neighbor. Now when do you use the, the, the word to? after lerach, le is to. When do you use to? You use to when you give something. You give to a donation to a company. You give a present to a person. So the Torah was very precise. You don't love your neighbor, you love to your neighbor. In case anybody make a mistake that the love of your neighbor is like the love of the fish, no, it's completely different. That's the Bible's position. And the Torah, I, I didn't find it anywhere else in the Torah. The Torah uses a, a love as we use it uh, regularly. But in this uh, particular place in the Torah, it's love to your neighbor. Very strange. Very strange. But it gives you the precise meaning. Uh, to understand how sometimes the translation into English loses the original original uh, meaning. There is a, a very known verse, uh, don't put an obstacle before the blind. Right? And you have it everywhere. This is the common translation. Don't put an obstacle in front of the blind. Is this what is written in the Torah? It's not don't put a, 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 an obstacle to the blind. Not at all. Don't give an obstacle to the blind. How can you give an obstacle to the blind? I'll give you an example. You're selling a second used, second hand car. You know there is a defect in the car. You don't tell to the buyer. This is to give, to give an obstacle to the blind. The buyer is the blind. And there are many other, other uh, examples. So don't put a, an obstacle to the blind. Everybody knows it. You don't have to state it. But not to give an obstacle to the blind. This is something new. And this is what is written in the Torah. And, and I give many other examples. So the Torah is very precise. Now, why is that important? I want to talk about names in the Bible. And you can't refer seriously to names in the Bible unless you understand that the Torah is mathematically precise. Because I can start giving all kinds of interpretation to names and uh, people will ask me, uh, why do you give such weight to names? I mean, uh, one time you use this name, another time you use the other name. Not so. In the Torah, every name has a meaning. And there are so many places in the Torah where names are referred to, related to. And we just start with the first chapter of uh, Genesis. Uh, God brings all the animals to Adam so that he will give names to the animals. Vayitzer Adonai Elohim in Adama, Kol Chayat Asadeh, Vet Kol Of Hashamayim, Vayave El Adam Lirot Mai Kol Ikalo, Vechol Asher Ika Lo Haadam Nefesh Chaya Hushmo. So already in the first chapter, such serious reference to names, because names describe the essence of that which, which is named. And then when you go on and on and on, in the, both in the, in the Torah and in the prophets, you see relating to names again and again and again. We know that uh, God uh, asked, uh, told Abraham that he should change his name. He put an extra letter in the name instead of Avram, Abraham. He put an A in the name. 
changing the name of Sarai, wife, the wife, Abraham's a wife, instead of Sarai, Sarah, and on and on and on. The most extraordinary verse that I find in the Torah is in Exodus. Vayedaber Elohim el Moshe vayomer elav ani Adonai. I'll translate it into English, preserving the names of God. And God, Elohim, and Elohim talked to Moses and said to him, I am Jehovah. Now when you look at these two names in the Bible, Elohim and Jehovah, they have very specific meanings. Very specific meanings. And when I go from one place to another, the Torah, the prophets, they are so precise in the use of the two names, Elohim and Jehovah. What's the difference between these two names? Now, we have to be very careful here. Because unlike other names in the Torah, when I said that the names express the essence of what is named, of course you can't say the same about God. So the two names are not names for God, but names for his leadership of the world. The word Elohim comes from force. El in Hebrew is force. Eloah, force. So when you refer to Elohim, you refer to the Creator. The one who has all the forces, right? Jehovah is completely different. Jehovah is the leadership of God in the area of randomness. This refers to morality, to righteousness, to grace. In fact, you have a certain chapter in uh, Exodus where you have details of the 13 virtues of the leadership of God. Adonai, Adonai, El Rachum, Vechanun, Erech Apaim, Verav Chesed, Vehemet. These are the virtues of the leadership of God, which is uh, concentrated in the name Jehovah. Now, if you understand these two names, meaning one name is God as a creator, Elohim, the ruler of all the forces of nature. The other name, Jehovah, which is the other side of the leadership of God, grace, righteousness, morality. Then we read again the verse, and God spoke to Moses and said, I am God. The two names are combined. And when you think about it, this is not self-evident. It's so peculiar. Why should God as creator will be also God as the source of morality, of righteousness, of virtue? You look at the gods in the old Greece, Rome, the pantheon of the, of the goddess that they had. Gods had emotions. Gods were fighting with each other. They didn't have morality. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. This is a verse that the Jew repeats a few times every day. The oneness of God. It's repeated everywhere, again and again and again. So you can ask yourself, oneness of God compared to what? Two God? Multiple gods? What do you mean the oneness of God? And I believe there is only one meaning to this verse. The oneness of God means that Elohim and Jehovah 
are one. Law of nature and morality, the source is one. Let me go back to the story of Adam and Eve. Because really here I find a validation to my perception of Elohim and Jehovah, which you see it so clearly in the story of the Adam and Eve and the scene of eating of the, uh, of the fruit of knowledge. Here again you have a problem with the translation. Because how do you uh, explain et adat tov vera? Ra in Hebrew is not evil. I, I, I'm so, so uh, uh, amazed at the translation of tov vera. Shall I tell you what is tov vera in quality engineering, which is my profession? For every product that we produce, there are requirements. Requirements from all kinds of perspectives. Requirements from the user of the product, requirements of the engineers, and so on. Just to give you one example, uh, you are buying a car. You don't require that the car will not turn over in a curve. But the engineers put this requirement. Why I'm saying it? Because there were cases in the past where very big companies produced cars, and in one case, the car, a small car, turned over in curves. So, when you start producing a product, you have requirements. And then you have to translate the requirements into specifications. When we produce the product, these are the specifications. What do we call Tov and Ra, or in our English, conforming or not conforming, good and bad? What is a good item and what is a bad item? A good item is that which conforms to the specifications. A bad item is one that does not conform to the specifications. I believe that Adam and Eve, Tov and Ra, have the, exactly the same interpretation, and I want to prove it to you. And this is my interpretation about the whole story, and it goes back to Elohim and Jehovah. You read the story, and you have the narrator relating to relating the story, talking about this, giving the story, the timeline of the story. And then you have Adam and Eve and the serpent talking. What name does the narrator use for God? Do you know what, he, what name is used? Jehovah Elohim. What is the name of God used by the serpent and Eve? Elohim only. What does it mean? And they want to eat of the fruit of knowledge so that they will be like Elohim. They don't want to be like Elohim Jehovah. They want to be like Elohim only. What does it mean to be like Elohim? Fruit of knowledge. If they'll be like Elohim, they'll know the law of nature and they'll be able to rule nature. But nothing to do with morality. They are not interested in morality. That's why they don't use the word Jehovah. In the story, you have the narrator 11 times referring to God by Elohim Jehovah. When Eve and the serpent refer to God, Adam doesn't mention God, but when serpent and Eve refer to God, four times, only Elohim. The world of the law of nature represent Elohim. We are not aware yet that the world of randomness represents Jehovah. And that's why we have this long, long history when we try to control nature but don't really mind about killing people. 
And I believe that the, what the prophets are saying, that when we are coming to the end's day, thou shalt not murder, will be considered as valid as the gravitation law. Today we don't see it, because we live in a world of randomness, and you know the word olam in Hebrew derived from concealment. From what? Concealment, hiddenness of God. But this is what allows us to be uh, human beings with free will. If God revealed himself, we will not have free will. The human condition is to live in two worlds. A world where the law of nature is visible, is apparent, we know what happens if we violate the law of nature. And there is another world of randomness where we have free will, we can't be certain what will happen as a result of our deeds. Randomness is still in the physical world. The randomness and the law of nature are here. Now I want to emphasize, when I am talking about randomness, I didn't say that there are no laws for randomness. We know chaos theory, we know statistics, but when I talk about randomness is how we as individuals experience it. And we experience both law of nature and we experience randomness. And only in the area of randomness can we exercise our free will? The two names, Elohim and Jehovah, is what is emphasized again and again and again in the Torah, in the prophets. These are two concepts of the leadership of God. I'm very uh, anxious and careful not to say that they describe God because we know nothing about God. But we can, and this is also uh, uh, rooted in the Torah. Uh, for example, when Moses wanted uh, God to show him his glory, uh, God said to him, you can't see me. You can, see only, you can only see me from behind. So we can only see the results of the leadership of God. So I'm very careful. The names do not refer to God. They refer to the leadership in the world. To be like God, to eat from the, no, from the tree of knowledge, and to be like God, they meant to be like Elohim. And this is human history. Because until now, what we did is trying, and successfully trying, to control the law of nature. In this area, where randomness rules, first, the Torah said, don't think that the, there is real randomness in the world. And there is one verse that I always repeat again and again, and it appears in my book. God says to the people of Israel, Im telchu imi bekeri, ve'alachti imachem bechamat keri. If you will walk with me, God said to the uh, people of Israel, if you walk with me with randomness, if you think that everything in the world is random, I will walk with you with the rat of randomness. Rat, anger of randomness. So you think it's random? I'll show you what random means. Things will befall you and you'll not know wherever it came from, it ever came to you. So the Torah said, in this area where you have free will, in the world of randomness. These are the laws. You don't have to make scientific experiments to know the laws. Here are the laws. You can either obey them or you can violate them. For the time being, it's free will. But you should know there is law, even if the law is not visible, like the law of gravitation. But you still have the free will to choose the wrong. whether to believe it or not. Because we were not in the Har Sinai, Mahmad Har Sinai, we were not there. Yeah. So you, Avi and me, as modern day individuals, have the free will to decide. First, whether we believe that God exists or not. And secondly, 
whether there is a law of morality that prevails in the world of randomness that for us looks completely random all the time. The Torah said, you're wrong. There is rule of morality because Elohim and Jehovah is one. The creator of the world and the source of morality, this is all one. And the Torah is very consistent about it. You see it in the use of Elohim and Adam and Jehovah. I'll give you just one example, more example. When you read the story of creation, the first chapter of Genesis, is there any Jehovah there? Not at all. When does Jehovah start? When is its first appearance? With the creation of men. Interesting, I mean, this is the mathematical precision of the Torah. In the creation of the world, there's only Elohim, because their Elohim is the creator of the world of the law of nature. And we have to obey this world, because we see it, we observe it, we know that if we don't obey the law of nature, penalty is immediate. In the world of randomness, if we look at it without any preconception, it's random, I can do whatever I like, there are no consequences. But the Torah said, you're right, you're wrong. Jehovah is Elohim. You think that there is no morality in the world in what happens to you? Think again. Thank you for joining us today in Eretz Israel with Torah on location. I'm Avi Ben Mordechai. We've been talking with Professor Chaim Shor, the uh, professor uh, from the Department of Industrial Engineering and Management at the Faculty of Engineering Sciences, Ben Gurion University of the Negev, concerning uh, cosmology, creation, the Biblical Hebrew, designs in Biblical Hebrew, all dealing with so many different and interesting ideas as presented in much of his own research over the decades in statistical analysis and some of his own personal opinions based on what he believed to be or understood to be coincidences in the Bible and uh, maybe they're not coincidences after all. Maybe there is great significance in everything that is being said from every Hebrew letter to a vowel to a word to a concept. We're going to look at all of these things and so much more. Thank you for joining us on today's program of Torah on Location. I'm Avi ben Mordechai. Shalom.